Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Candace Fallon and I'm a senior conservation biologist here at the Xerces Society. And I'm gonna be talking to you today about the conservation of fireflies in the US and Canada. So just to go over our topics for today, I'm gonna to start by discussing firefly distribution and life history. And then I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the value of fireflies before moving into population status and threats. And then I'll be talking about some recommendations and resources for you all. So just diving right into distribution and life history. Um, what are fireflies? Before I get too far along, I wanna talk about this word firefly. Um, fireflies, which are also called lightning bugs or glowworms, um, are actually beetles. They're not worms or flies or bugs at all. And there are about 2,000 species reported from around the world, and they're found on every continent except Antarctica. Here in North America, north of Mexico, there are about 170 species recorded, and they're found in every state except Hawaii and almost all of the Canadian provinces and territories. And a lot of times when we think about fireflies, we just think about them um, existing east of the Mississippi in more central and eastern parts of the US and Canada. But as you can see from this map, um, the darker colors show higher numbers of species reported. Um, and we do have quite a few in the east and south, but we have fireflies scattered all across the country. And this includes not just our flashing species, but also our glowworms. And we actually have some daytime active fireflies as well. So although it's pretty easy to think of fireflies as a single species, um, like I said, we have a little more than 168 uh, species documented from these two countries. And you know, this flashing uh, firefly that you can see on the basil plant here is probably our best known kind of firefly. Um, but they're actually a really diverse group of beetles with really diverse habitat associations, life histories, um, feeding preferences, and courtship activities. And so all three of the insects that you see on the slides here are actually all fireflies. So like all beetles, fireflies undergo complete metamorphosis. That means they go through four stages with an egg, a larva, a pupa, and an adult. Um, and the larva and the pupa of many species live underground. Um, although some species, such as pyrectamina, can also live on the sides of trees. Um, female glowworms are flightless and they live underground as well. Um, as you can see from this picture, a lot of our firefly larvae are, well, all of them, are voracious predators. They feed mostly on soft-bodied invertebrates, and this can include snails, slugs, earthworms, millipedes, anything that's kind of soft. And most species require some sort of moisture for their life cycle, so habitats will have that uh, feature. So fireflies are probably best known for their light. Um, and this bioluminescence is thought to have evolved over time um, to warn predators that they are toxic or distasteful. Um, and then we think that over evolutionary time, some species kind of co-opted this light and it's now used as a um, courtship signal. And all firefly larvae do produce light, but not all of the adults produce light. Like I mentioned before, we have some daytime active fireflies, um, which actually use pheromones to communicate, um, and then glowworms, which tend to glow rather than flash, and they're not as uh, often seen as some of our flashing species. And this light that they produce is actually produced through a biochemical uh, reaction. And interestingly, different firefly species can actually emit different colors or wavelengths of light. Um, so species that are active um, at dusk, when you might still be able to see some foliage or vegetation, they tend to use uh, non-green colors to make sure that the flashes actually can be seen against that green vegetation. Um, so they might use more light or, or um, yellow or amber light, whereas species that are active in full dark might actually use green light. So like I said before, um, the word firefly includes these three main types of um, these three groups. We have our flashing fireflies over here to the left. 
We have our glowworms, which include females that are flightless. Uh, a lot of times they look very similar to the larva, as you can see from this picture. And in glowworms, it's typically the females that are glowing from their abdomens, while the males look like typical adults and they'll be flying around looking for these signals. Um, and then we also have our daytime dark fireflies, which as their name implies, are active during the day. And as you can see from the antenna on this particular male, um, they are thought to use chemical pheromones to communicate rather than light. So those antennae are actually seeking out these pheromones in the air. So we think that most adult fireflies don't eat, and there are exceptions to this rule, as there are with most um, of the natural world. Um, some of those exceptions include females of some of the Futurus species, uh, and these will actually lure in males of other firefly species and eat them. So they mimic the flash of these other species, which is pretty cool. Um, other species of fireflies have actually been documented nectaring on flowers. So they've been seen on goldenrod, um, some late season asters, and even common milkweed. And then we also have some documentation of fireflies actually drinking nectar um, or sap from maple trees. So fireflies can be found in a really wide variety of habitats. So you can see from this slide, um, they can be found anywhere from desert canyons to your urban backyard. They can be found in riparian forests, open prairies, um, even places like soybean fields and overgrown lots. It really depends on the species. But there's one primary um, feature of all of these that fireflies depend on, and that's some sort of moisture. And this can take, um, this can be, you know, humidity or dew or something like that, but particularly in the arid west, um, some kind of permanent water source is really important for fireflies just because the surrounding landscape is so dry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the value of fireflies. I think most of us can agree that fireflies are pretty beautiful, pretty aesthetically um, inspiring. If you've ever had the chance to see flashing fireflies on a summer night, it's really incredible. Um, but fireflies have a lot of other values as well. Uh, of course, they have an intrinsic value. They also have ecological value as both predators and prey in the food chain. Um, and they also have played really important roles in biomedical research. And um, more and more, they're also playing a role in different community science programs as well. So fireflies have captured the human imagination for centuries. We have records of them um, being documented for hundreds and hundreds of years. There have been celebrations, um, art, literature, poetry, all these different um, aspects of human life and culture have in some way incorporated fireflies and celebrated fireflies. Uh, in particular, the synchronous fireflies have really inspired a lot of um, joy and uh, art as well. These are the fireflies that over time will all come together and start flashing in unison. And sometimes you can have hundreds or thousands of individuals in one place all flashing together. And um, here in the U.S., probably the most famous site for uh, synchronous fireflies is actually in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which borders Tennessee and North Carolina. So like I said earlier, fireflies are really voracious predators. You can see in this slide over here on the left, this firefly is actually eating out of a snail shell, one of its preferred food sources. Uh, they also eat slugs and earthworms and other soft-bodied invertebrates. Uh, because of this, they can be really important predators in your garden or if you have a farm. Uh, they can take care of some of these other invertebrates that are sometimes considered pests for your food sources. But firefly larvae will actually attack their prey by grabbing them and injecting them with this uh, poison that immobilizes them. Um, and then merrily eating away <laughs> at what's left. Um, like I said, adults rarely feed, although there are some of the exceptions that I talked about. Um, 
And fireflies also act as prey for other species, and definitely more so for invertebrate predators than vertebrates. A lot of fireflies have uh, toxic compounds in them called lucibufagans or LBGs, we call them for short. And pretty much, I think almost all fireflies have these compounds, which makes them distasteful or toxic, uh, but the Futurus fireflies don't. And those are the fireflies that I said, the females will actually eat other fireflies. And they're doing this so that they can actually take up those toxins and the other fireflies and then pass them on to their young. It's a pretty neat situation there. Um, there's a whole suite of different invertebrates that will feed on fireflies. Probably the most well-documented are spiders. We also have assassin bugs and hanging flies. Um, you can see in this picture that a spider has actually captured a firefly in its web. And interestingly enough, those Futurus females who eat other fireflies, they've actually been known to steal fireflies out of firefly or out of spider webs um, and eat them for their own, which is called kleptoparasitism. Fireflies have also played important roles in biomedical research. This is an image of a luciferase protein. Um, but fireflies produce light through this chemical reaction, as I mentioned, and it involves an enzyme called luciferase. And this enzyme really caught the attention of researchers many decades ago. And um, back then, they would actually send out these ads trying to get people to collect massive amounts of fireflies. And I've seen historic photos of just mounds of fireflies on these desks of people sending them in so that they could isolate this um, luciferase and use it in research. And luckily in the 80s, they came up with a synthetic version. So um, we don't need to collect massive amounts of fireflies anymore which is nice, um, but this actually enables researchers to kind of detect different things happening in cells because it lights things up. Um, it's also used to detect bacterial contamination in milk and meat and other food products. Um, they've used it to visualize HIV transmission, um, detect blood clots, things like that. So at this point, you've probably heard of firefly declines, um, whether it's locally or across the world. And here's just a couple quotes. There have been a lot of articles in the last decade about, you know, are fireflies declining? Are their lights blinking out? Um, are they disappearing? And, you know, both of these quotes, I think, really show that um, we, Anecdotally, you think they are declining. There's so many reports, people saying they're seeing fewer in their backyards, in their communities, but we have very little monitoring data to back those up. Um, and we do have researchers who have been studying different sites, and they say that they are also seeing declines, but it's hard to say what's happening with fireflies across a broad range or across their whole population. Um, so we definitely need to look, look more into this. But global insect declines have been making headlines recently. Um, and we think that the drivers for firefly declines are really similar to those affecting insects more broadly. So the largest threats are thought to be habitat degradation and loss, including fragmentation, um, pesticide use, poor water quality, light pollution, which is really important for species that are active in the dark. Um, Overcollection for medical research was definitely an issue before the 80s, and that uh, hopefully is not so much of an issue now, but probably impacted firefly populations at the time. And then things like invasive species, um, whether animal or plant, that can displace fireflies or their habitat, and also um, impacts associated with climate change. So whether that's increasing drought that dries out the water table or other moisture sources that they need, or things like rising sea levels, which can actually flood out um, different firefly habitats for those that live along the coast. And I think it's really important to point out here too, um, when we talk about firefly declines, it's really important to think about the different life stages of fireflies and how they're impacted by each of these um, threats. And in particular, most firefly species are actually, they spend most of their lives in the larval stage. And for some species, it can be up to two years. Um, so when we think about things that impact the ground level, we really wanna think about fireflies being down there for a long period of time. 
So habitat loss and degradation are considered the leading causes of decline for a lot of animal species, including insects. And we think that in the US and Canada, this is probably the number one threat to fireflies. Um, this can take many different forms. It can be you know, residential or commercial development. It can be conversion to agriculture. Um, it can be water pollution, things like groundwater pumping in the West or diversion and modification of waterways. All of these things can really impact firefly habitats. This picture is actually of a site in Delaware where um, there's a really rare species that is known to occur here and recently had some houses developed at the site. And so you can see that all the plants that the fireflies were using before have been cut down and these boardwalks have been placed. So it's really a huge impact on that local population. Uh, pesticides, including both insecticides and herbicides, are also having uh, most likely impacts on fireflies. Uh, we actually have very little research about direct impacts of um, any kind of pesticide on fireflies, but what we do know, we've been able to kind of infer from other studies on closely related beetle species. Um, and fireflies can be exposed to pesticides in many different ways. They can be directly impacted through application um, directly onto them or their habitats, or indirectly through runoff, um, different ways of, you know, they can get it through consumption of their prey if their prey have been impacted. So there are different many, there are many different routes um, of transmission. So flashing fireflies and glowworms, all of our species that are active at dusk or night, really need dark nights. Uh, and they're not the only species that need this. Um, more than 60% of invertebrates are actually nocturnal. Um, and so they're much more vulnerable to things like light pollution. Um, we think that actually three quarters of fireflies in the US and Canada are active either at dusk or night. So this makes quite a few of our species um, more vulnerable to this type of pollution. Um, and researchers recently have been speculating that um, things like sky glow, which you can see over here to the left um, from cities and other urban areas, and even light trespass, which is light that escapes outside of windows um, in places where you know it's not meant to be, and other forms of light pollution are probably having really negative impacts on fireflies and other nocturnal species. Um, and these photos too, uh, this one on the right was taken, um, it's a NASA photo of the US at night and you can see how much of the country is actually lit up at night. And when you think about, if you remember that map I showed you earlier where most of the flashing species occur, it's, they're almost all found east of the Mississippi. So they're all in this area that's just really increasing in brightness at night. So we think this is probably having a really heavy impact on firefly populations. Like I said, climate change is also probably affecting fireflies. Um, this can come through flooding of habitat from rising sea levels, um, desiccation or drying out due to drought. And this goes not just for fireflies, but also their prey. When you think about the things they like to eat, like snails and slugs, those things are also usually really dependent on damp sites. And so if you don't have that for the food, then you probably aren't gonna have as many fireflies as well. Um, and because firefly populations probably depend on, you know, local things like local weather in addition to climate, um, any kind of changes in those are probably going to affect them. And this can be seen in changes in emergence, emergence times, um, so how early they might come out in the spring, um, or even how long they're active in any given year. And it can also have impacts on species abundances, um, and ranges, uh, elevational gradients, things like that. So in addition to all of these threats, uh, there are certain life history traits that also may make certain firefly species even more vulnerable to threats. Um, this firefly here is one of our glowworms. It's the California pink glowworm. Um, and the females are flightless. And so these females, as with many, if not all glowworm species, um, are much more vulnerable to things like ground disturbances. They can be easily crushed 
if anything's happening at their site, if there's flooding or, you know, physical compaction or fire or anything like that, they don't have an easy way to disperse. They can't fly away like the males can. Um, and these are really the future of firefly populations. They're the ones that um, lay eggs and um, it really just has an impact cascading through the populations. Uh, again, species that require true night are probably more vulnerable to things like light pollution. Uh, the lights that occur um, are actually interfering with their ability to communicate with each other. And so when you think about it, if you have a male flying overhead, flashing, and then waiting for a response from a female that might be sitting on the ground, and she might just have a few faint flashes herself. But if you have all this other light interfering, it can be really hard to tell, you know, this is a female that's interested in me, or this is just the neighbor's uh, porch light. So it can really be difficult for species to communicate. And if they're not communicating, they're not mating, they're not laying eggs, there's no future fireflies. So that was all the bad news, <laughs> um, but what can you do to help? And there are actually quite a few things. Um, but first, it's really important to understand and remember what it is that fireflies need. So in addition to protection from things like pesticides and other you know, impacts to the habitat, there are four main things they need. Moisture, and that's to prevent them from drying out or their prey from drying out. They need a food source, so soft-bodied invertebrates for the larvae. Um, some kind of shelter, and this can take many forms. A lot of species, especially as larvae and flightless females, um, and even females that do fly, they'll take, sh they'll take shelter in leaf litter, um, pine needles, they might crawl under rocks or even into small burrows or other openings. Um, some can be found in rotting logs. Uh, things like that. And then the males especially may just perch on vegetation during the day, um, especially for ones that are night active. They might just sit there and rest during the day. And then we also need dark nights for our species that are active at night. So some key actions that you can take uh, to protect fireflies include um, protecting them from ground disturbing activities, so leaving your leaf litter and mulch, mowing less often, um, being really conscious about uh, your pesticide use, and eliminating all cosmetic uses. You know, um, and also if you are using pesticides, if you need to use them, being really targeted in your approach, not just kind of broad spraying um, pesticides everywhere. Uh, reducing light pollution. And then also thinking about those different needs that they have and maybe augmenting your habitat if you have a chance to plant other species or making sure that some sort of shelter is included, um, places for them to hide. So I'm gonna talk about these in a little more depth. Uh, so first, leave the leaves. Um, Leaf litter is really important for fireflies. Not only does it provide shelter, but it also helps retain soil moisture, which is really important for them. Um, and this is important not just for fireflies, but a whole host of other uh, insect species um, and other invertebrates. And some ways you can do this is just by refraining from raking or leaf blowing, or if you are going to gather those up, um, think about using that as your mulch. So placing it around trees and other plantings rather than just carrying it off and away from your site. Mowing less often may also um, benefit fireflies. As I was saying, a lot of firefly species will take refuge on different grasses or forbs during the day. And so if you're mowing those down when they're inactive, they may not be able to get away in time. And then also for larvae and females um, that are mostly at ground level, you could compact the earth or crush them um, just by rolling the mower over. And then also considering where the blade is. So, we often tell folks that if you are going to mow, um, try to mow in small patches that you rotate over time so you're not always mowing the entire area. Or you could raise your mower blades um, and give them maybe you know, 8 to 12 inches so that you're not mowing straight down across the ground and giving them a chance to, to avoid those mower blades. 
whenever possible, um, eliminating pesticide use is going to benefit fireflies and many other uh, species as well. Um, again, if you do need to use them, really working to minimize their impacts to their habitat. And you can do that um, by spot treating, um, also having some sort of, uh, you know, pest detection program, early detection program where you're being really proactive about getting out there and seeing what's out there and um, taking care of it before it becomes really widespread. Like I was saying, fireflies use a really wide variety of habitats and so it's hard to make just, you know, a couple broad statements about what to plant. Um, when thinking about fireflies, but I think just really emphasizing to plant native and to make your habitat as diverse as possible. And this is gonna help, you know, so many other species of wildlife as well. Um, but fireflies use all different types of plants. So they might use grasses and small flowering plants um, to perch on. Some species will nectar on them. Um, as I said, it helps retain soil moisture. Shrubs are also important. Um, they provide more shelter as well, and they're also used as perches by different species. Um, and then trees as well, they provide shade to the area, which can be important for holding in more moisture. And trees can actually also be really good for blocking out light pollution. So if you have a lot of light in your area, those might be helpful as well. And there are actually some species of fireflies that will pupate or overwinter on the sides of trees and they will use the furrows of really deeply furrowed trees um, and kind of tuck in there. Um, and some species will actually return to the same overwintering trees year after year, which is pretty neat. So you can um, use all different species and something to remember too is that depending on the species of firefly that you might have in your yard or in your community, a lot of them will partition where in the landscape they will signal from. And so some species only signal from the treetops, whereas others may fly really low across the ground. Um, others might perch more at shrub height. And so having a really wide variety of both heights and structures in your plants will be beneficial for different species. Um, something else to emphasize, I think, is allowing some area of your yard or your natural area to um, remain natural. Let it get a little wild, a little unkempt. It really helps fireflies to have places that they can tuck into and hide. Um, if you can add or retain things like rotting logs, um, you know, areas with more grass and shrubs and forbs, just places where they can really seek shelter and find um, better sources of food will help them out a lot. And if you live in an area where mosquitoes aren't a big issue, you could even consider putting in some sort of water feature, like a little uh, pond or even just keeping some areas of your yard a little damper. And if that's just from planting like a shade garden or something like that, but something to um, really increase the moisture content of your site. So fireflies need dark nights, as I've said um, many times in this presentation, but any way that you can eliminate or at least reduce or limit the amount of light at your site is going to help fireflies. Um, as much as it's practical or you know, considering different safety needs, um, either removing lights or installing motion detectors or lights that are on some sort of uh, timer system can really ensure that your space is only being lit as much as needed. And then even considering the way your lights shine out. And so if you're trying to light a pathway or a sidewalk, really considering um, shielding the light so that it just focuses right on the area where you need to be walking and not spilling out across um, any plantings or other areas nearby. Uh, you could also swap out your really bright lights for dim red lights. Um, the research is still ongoing for uh, how different wavelengths of light affect different firefly species, but overall it seems like red or amber light has the least negative impact to fireflies. Um, so the next time you change a bulb, maybe consider using a dimmer um, bulb than the really bright LEDs. 
You could also, they have these really cheap red plastic filters that you could put over your existing lights and that also helps um, reduce the issues for fireflies. And finally, as you are getting out and getting to know your fireflies in your community, uh, we hope you'll contribute to community science efforts. And like I said earlier, there have been a few programs really growing in the last few years to start tracking the distribution of fireflies and also the types of habitats that they need and use. So I'm just gonna talk about a few of those projects. Um, probably the largest project in the US right now is Firefly Watch, which is run by Mass Audubon. And they are looking for volunteers who are gonna commit to going back to a site, um, ideally every week, um, even more ideally year after year. And it, you commit to about 10 minutes at a time of observing fireflies and really marking um, you know, how many you saw, what types of flash patterns were there, uh, what time of night it was. Um, and they're using these observations to um, see if they can start tracking changes in populations. And you'll see from this map that the vast majority of records are from east of the Mississippi. And like I said, you know, this is where the majority of flashing species are found. Although we do have some small pockets of flashing species in the west in places like Utah and Colorado. Um, but this is definitely um, so far has been primarily in the east. And this is just tracking our flashing species. Out in the West, we have the Western Firefly Project, and this started with the Natural um, History Museum out of Utah. So a lot of the records right now are just from Utah, but they just expanded the project to all Western states. And so hopefully we'll be getting more data points from those. Um, but they're also, this one's focused on flashing fireflies as well. And so in the West, that's primarily the genus Pyrectomina. Um, so this is just a really great program to get involved with if you're in one of the Western states. And then there's also an iNaturalist project. Um, FIN, the Fireflyers International Network, they have regional iNaturalist projects all over the world. Um, so this is the one for the US and Canada. You can see they already have over 13,000 observations. So this is a pretty cool way to see what species already occur in your area. And this includes not just the flashing species, but also our glowworms and our day active species. So this is a nice way to kind of um, get a sense for your local fauna. There are now several guidebooks that are really helpful for IDing fireflies. And we did not have these uh, a few years ago. So it's really exciting to have um, some new guides out. Uh, this book by Lynn Faust, Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs is really great for the central and eastern US and probably Canada as well. Yeah, Canada. Um, and so she has tons of color photos and ID tips for a huge number of species that can be found in the east. Uh, Sarah Lewis's book, Silent Sparks, is a really nice mix of introducing people to fireflies and the magic that is fireflies. And then she also has kind of a more general guide to the most common genera that you'll see in the US. And then for the West, um, Larry Bushman, um, who's out of Kansas, he's been putting together this draft um, ID guide to species mostly in Kansas and Colorado, but also in a few other surrounding states. And so I'm hoping that that will grow over time as we learn more about fireflies in the West. And so as you're learning more and tracking fireflies, uh, we hope we'll, you'll start going out to advocate and educate for fireflies. Um, and this can take many forms. It can be just encouraging folks in your neighborhood or community to think about fireflies and create or protect habitat for them. Um, you could join a local chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. And this is a really incredible group that um, they basically advocate for local policies to control or mitigate light pollution. And there are chapters all over the world, but they have a lot of really great resources on their website for how to change out your lighting, how to talk to your local municipality about changing you know, street lights and things like that. And even talking to your neighbors, they have a lot of really good talking points. 
Um, and just sharing information with friends and family as well is really important. Uh, I think a lot of people know and love fireflies, but don't necessarily know what to do to help them. So just sharing that information can be really helpful. And finally, I just want to close out by mentioning our new conservation guidelines, which we co-authored with Firefly researchers from Tufts University. And a lot of what I've covered in this talk today is actually pulled from these conservation guidelines. Uh, we go really in depth on firefly life history and distribution. We talk about all the threats I mentioned today. And then we give really concrete steps for ways to protect fireflies, um, things to do for planting habitat, restoring habitat, um, advocating for them within your community. So I really encourage you to check it out. It's available on our website and the link is right here. Um, and you can also just check out the Firefly pages on the Xerces website as well. So I hope you enjoyed this talk today. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, I'm always happy to talk to people about fireflies. You can just email us at fireflies at And thanks for watching our video.